Hey there folks and welcome back. For our last topic in multivariable integral calculus, we are going to be talking about triple integrals. This is sort of like the beefy older brother to double integrals, which hopefully by now you're feeling somewhat comfortable working with. For a bit more information, check out section 12.5 from the textbook. Okay, so to motivate our discussion today, allow me to remind you of how we defined the double integral. We started our discussion by assuming that we had some function, z equals f of x, y, whose graph was a curved surface living above a rectangle, r, in the x, y plane. And we wanted to know the volume under our curve and above this region r. Well, finding that volume exactly might be pretty tough. So we start with an approximation. We slice up our rectangular region r into a bunch of tiny pieces by making cuts in the x-axis and the y-axis. And then on each one of those pieces, we approximate the volume under our surface using the volume of one of these rectangular boxes. The box's height is given by the height of the function at some point in this region. Let's say it's f of x i y j. Of course, we then have to multiply by the area of the base, which is really the change in x times the change in y. So our volume of one box is given by this formula here, and we have to add up all of those box volumes to approximate the total volume under our curve. That's this sum that you see here. By letting the number of cuts in the x-axis and y-axis go off to infinity, we get a better and better approximation of the volume. And that limit we call the double integral of our function, the double integral over r of f dA. Of course, we've seen in practice that we don't actually evaluate double integrals by calculating this limit from scratch. Rather, we think of the double integral as two single integrals, one with respect to x and one with respect to y. If we're integrating over a rectangle, the order doesn't matter. Okay, there we go, folks. A quick review of how we integrate over two-dimensional regions. But why stop at two dimensions? Can we integrate over a three-dimensional region? Well, we can, but we have to make some new definitions. As you'll see on the next slide, when we go from double integrals to triple integrals, we're really using all these same ideas. Okay, suppose now we have some function of three variables, w equals f of x, y, z. The domain of this function is a subset of R3, right? It's a three-dimensional region. But still, we want to extend what we know for double integrals to define some kind of an integral for functions of this type. How do we do it? Well, let's start with the simplest case, where we're trying to integrate over some kind of a rectangle in the domain. Of course, since everything is three-dimensional, this rectangle will really be a rectangular box. The x values are between constants a and b, the y values between c and d, and I'm not too good with my alphabet, but the z values will be between g and h. To define the integral, we're going to do exactly what we did for double integrals. I'm going to cut up my axes into a bunch of tiny little pieces, and that will in turn cut up my region into a bunch of tiny little cubes. When we carried out this process for double integrals, we ended up with a little rectangular grid in the xy plane. And our next step was to take the area of each grid rectangle and multiply it by one of the values of our function, f of xi, yj. Well, we're going to do exactly the same thing here with these cubes. So maybe I take one of the cubes, that cube right there. I'm going to take a value of my function inside that cube, f of xi, yj, zk, and I'm going to multiply it by the volume of the cube, delta x, delta y, delta z. Our next step was to add up all of these quantities. So let's do that here too. I'm going to add up over all i, j, and k the value of my function, f of x, i, y, j, z, k, times the tiny volume of my cube, delta x, delta y, delta z. And then I take the number of cuts that I've made and I let that go off to infinity. So I take the limit of, say, m, n, and l, those will be my number of cuts, and I send that off to infinity. This crazy expression will be the definition of my triple integral. I'll define the triple integral over this solid e of my function f of x, y, z. And instead of writing dA, I'm going to write dV to represent a tiny change in volume. It will be this hideous limit. Now, as you've probably guessed, we don't compute triple integrals by evaluating this limit. Instead, we do the same trick we did for double integrals. If you're integrating over a rectangular region, 
your triple integral can be thought of as three single integrals, and the order does not matter. So here you can see I'm writing the integral first with respect to z, then y, then x. But if we're over a rectangular box, I could equivalently write this first with respect to y, then with respect to z, then with respect to x, and so on. Mix it up as much as you like. Now before we move on to triple integrals over more complicated regions, there's an important note that needs to be mentioned. Notice that throughout this entire discussion on triple integrals, I never once said that the triple integral is computing the volume underneath the graph of our function. And that's because that's not what it's doing. Remember that the graph of this function is some surface living in a four-dimensional space. So it's not something we can easily visualize. And as a result, we lose the geometric interpretation of our integral. For a single integral, we can think about areas. For a double integral, we think about volumes. For a triple integral, we don't have the same sort of geometric interpretation. This does not mean that triple integrals are not worth studying. In certain circumstances, they can still tell us about volumes or other physical attributes of our function. Think back to how you set up double integrals over non-rectangular domains. You probably started by sketching the domain of integration and then deciding if it was type 1 or type 2. If it was type 1, that meant that x was between two constant values and y was between two functions. You integrated y first and then x. If it was type 2, the reverse was true. y was between two constants and x was between two functions. So you integrated x first. For triple integrals, it's very much the same. We start by graphing our three-dimensional domain of integration, we look at the boundaries of that domain, and we decide which variable to integrate first. Now we have more than just a couple types of regions, so we're no longer going to bother numbering them as type 1, 2, 3, etc. You'll just have to decide how to set up the integral on a case-by-case -case basis. So here I have three possibilities. This is not all the possibilities, but it gives you an idea of what could happen and how you might set up your integral. First take a look at the region I have on the left. Here it looks like z is bounded between two curved surfaces that might depend on x and y. So in this case I'll integrate z first. It runs from the lower curve to the upper curve. The lower curve is maybe h1 of xy and the upper curve is h2 of xy. Thus we're left to decide the order for the x and y integrals. To do this we look at the projection of our region down in the xy plane. Here, you can see we're dealing with the type 1 region. y is between two functions of x, and x is between two constants. And that's how we set up our integral. y goes from g1x to g2x, and x goes between constants a and b. Now take a look at the second example. Maybe, once again, z is bounded between two functions of x and y. So we'll integrate z first. It goes from the lower function, h1, to the upper function, h2. To decide the order for the remaining variables, well, we once again look at our projection on the xy plane. Here you can see that we're dealing with a type 2 region, right? x goes between two functions of y, and y goes between two constants. So we would next integrate with respect to x from the left function g1y to the right function g2y. Those are the functions you see here. And we end by integrating y from the constant a to the constant b. Finally, in our last picture, you can see that it's not always going to be the case that z gets integrated first. Here, y looks like it's bounded between two complicated functions involving x and z. Right? So maybe we choose to integrate y first. It goes from the leftmost function, h1, to the rightmost function, h2. To figure out the order on our remaining integrals, we project this time onto the x-z plane. Here, you can see that x is bounded between two functions of z, and z is bounded between two constants. So we would next integrate with respect to x between the left function and the right function, and finally integrate z between the constant values. Now the purpose of this slide was just to give you an idea of what you might see out in the wild, but don't be afraid if you're not feeling completely confident with setting up these integrals. It can be difficult to visualize what's going on without a specific example in mind, so go check out my example videos. There I do this exact sort of thing, and I think it will make a lot more sense. To end this video, I'm going to extend some of our applications of integration to the setting of triple integrals. If you think back to our discussion on applications of double integrals, we learned that if you compute the double integral over a region R of the constant function 1 dA, 
Well, what you're really computing is the area of your region R. Something similar happens for triple integrals. If you calculate the triple integral over a 3D region E of the constant function 1, well, what you're really computing is the volume of your region. Secondly, for double integrals, if you want to know the average value of a function f over some 2D region r, you can take the double integral of f and divide by the area of r. Something similar happens here. If you want to know the average of a 3-variable function over a 3D region e, take the triple integral of the function and divide by the volume of the region. Finally, for double integrals, if you have some function fxy that represents a density, mass density, population density, whatever, the double integral of that function gives you back the total amount of that quantity throughout your 2D region. Well, the exact same thing is going to be true for triple integrals. If f of x, y, z represents some sort of a density function, mass density, population density, charge density, you name it, then the triple integral over our 3D region E of the function f dv is going to represent the total amount of that quantity throughout our 3D region.